So, well, welcome everybody. It is great to be here. I've been involved with Chad for, I don't know, 20 years, something, who knows. Um, and I'm really happy to be talking about relationships in, in particular and how relationships affect, um, or how one partner's ADHD can affect a relationship for both partners and some things that both partners can do to make life a little bit better. So let's jump in. Um, so, you know, obviously we're social creatures. We are all about relationships with romantic partners, with family members in general, with our peers, with coworkers, classmates, neighbors, right? We are all about social contact. Um, and ADHD is part of that, right? Like it does affect how you sort of show up in those relationships and it affects how other people show up um, in the relationship as well. So on the one hand, I'm all in favor of kind of working to minimize the ways that ADHD, if it isn't well managed, affects how how you, if you're the person with ADHD, kind of show up in those things. Just like if someone struggles with anxiety, I would hope to kind of work on ways to reduce the anxiety or whatever the situation of the moment is. So absolutely, right, working on ways to minimize that impact of ADHD is important. And I spend a lot of time with clients every day. I've done a lot of writing and presenting, talking about that. Um, and yet, at the same time, there's always going to be a bit of something, right? Even if you respond really well to medication, if, even if you work really hard and you're really diligent at like putting things on your to-do list and sending reminders and stuff, you're never going to be perfect, but you don't have to be. And then the question is, if there is still a bit of ADHD in the mix, so to speak, is it a big enough deal that it actually takes away from that meaningful life and meaningful relationship? So to keep our relationships really satisfying, especially if we're talking about over the years and the decades, all of us need to work on ourselves, right? And there's nothing like a relationship to kind of challenge you to work on yourself. Um, a line that I've, I've sort of... Uh, use a lot is that a good relationship pushes you to become a better person. And I really, really believe that to be true. Mostly this is romantic relationships, but it's also other close family relationships. So in other words, our kids, our parents, our siblings, maybe very close friends. Um, but the reason is that Acquaintances, by contrast, right? Like acquaintances don't really care that much and we don't really care what acquaintances think and what acquaintances do doesn't have that big of an impact on us. But our closest relationships and especially our romantic partner, what they do has a really big effect on us. And even what they think and feel can have a really big effect on us and vice versa. This is where the rubber hits the road, right? This is the place where as a couple, we sort of struggle and we wrestle and we do a bit of a tug of war to try to figure out the best ways to live together, to be happy, to meet each other's needs, to meet our own needs and to just create a situation that feels good for both people. Not easy, but it is the way that, that we get there. It is the thing that will challenge us the most and hopefully bring out the best in us as much as sometimes it also brings out the worst. So obviously then, you know, we know ADHD is an individual condition in the sense that, you know, one person has ADHD, but because we bring ourselves in all ways to our relationship, one partner who has ADHD, like that ADHD will have an effect on their ability to be the partner that they want to be. So if you're the partner with ADHD, probably like, I don't know, you wanna be attentive. You wanna remember what your partner says. You wanna be able to be counted on, to be, I don't know, just sort of reliable about the things that you offer to do. And if you're the non-ADHD partner, you know, you wanna be supportive. You wanna be compassionate. You wanna be understanding. You want to kind of give some benefit of the doubt and then cut a bit of slack when performance doesn't meet you know, what was hoped for. Um, and yet, you know, also, it's easy to personalize 
ADHD-based mistakes. In other words, if, if you really cared about what I wanted, you would have remembered to, I don't know, stop at the store and grab some milk, right? Like you remember your stuff. If, if my stuff was also equally important, then you'd remember my stuff too, for example. Um, but also then on the flip side of that, if you're the partner with ADHD, it's really easy to get kind of defensive about your partner's reactions. Cause it's that like, here we go again, as usual, I gotta be the one who's getting blamed for stuff. As usual, I'm the one disappointing um, the people who are important to me. So, you know, it's easy to see how couples with one partner who has ADHD can kind of get tangled up in these kind of struggles. Um, and how, again, we can bring out the best in each other and also we bring out the worst. Um, in general, you know, all of us, um, we kind of, I don't know, like we expect a lot from our partners, right? We want our partners to be kind of reliable, consistent and supportive, you know, to handle the sort of responsibilities of adult life. But we also want our partners to be kind of fun and interesting, right? Like it's a life partner. It's not a business partner. It's not an admin assistant, right? Like we want someone to actually enjoy and to, I don't know, get some of the better parts of life out uh, with. So as, as I sort of joke, right, it's sort of, we want our partners to be a mix of sometimes being a life insurance salesman and sometimes being like a roadie for Motley Crue, right? We want reliable and consistent, and we also want someone to be fun. And what can happen in a couple that's a bit too imbalanced in this regard is that they sort of what's called polarize each other, meaning they push each other further out to the poles. One, one partner is a bit better at being organized. One partner is a bit better at saying like, screw that, let's have some fun right now. And then they just get more and more and more. So the partner who's good at being organized feels more and more pressure to be the one who keeps it all organized. The other partner who's a bit better at enjoying the moment, shall we say, might feel like, look, we can't just work. Like we gotta have some fun also. Let's just relax a little bit. And then they go like this. And the further out they get, the less they get along, the less they understand each other. And you know, all the other good fun things like having sex together gets kind of squeezed out and they lose that connection that brought them together in the first place. So I have a saying that ADHD doesn't invent new problems. It just exacerbates the universal ones. And this is true for individuals out in the world. It's also true for couples that ADHD doesn't create brand new scenarios. It just makes the usual scenarios more common and more frequent, more maybe severe. So Every couple has to negotiate differences. Every couple has to kind of work to understand each other, even when what their partner doing doesn't seem to make any sense. Every couple needs to find ways to behave with respect, to be kind of accommodating while also being assertive, right? You can't give too much away without feeling resentful. You can't take too much without ex expecting your partner to become resentful themselves, right? So. Every couple needs to sort this stuff out. And I think that that's an important thing maybe to kind of remind yourself of when it feels like your situation is unique, every other couple has it easier or your friends or your siblings or whatever. Some things about their relationship probably are easier. Other things are gonna be harder. Every couple has its struggles. So there is actually hope in that, that kind of we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to figure this out as we go along. So let's talk about five big recommendations, like five things that are actually gonna make your life better. So um, the first one, and I put this right up front on purpose, is consider medication for ADHD. Like I'm a psychologist, I don't write prescriptions. It's not, medication's not always my first go-to. Um, I don't make money from drug companies. It's like I don't have any financial investment in it, but when it comes to managing ADHD, I'm a pretty big proponent of medication. Not necessarily everybody, but for those who need it, a little bit of the right medication really, really can make a difference. And it can make a difference that you can feel. Um, and sometimes I sort of, I think about it as 
medication for ADHD closes the gap between intentions and actions. That folks with ADHD usually have really good intentions. They mean to do well, but it's a, it's a problem of execution. It's a problem of following through with those good intentions and really making things happen as consistently as they would like them to. Um, by far the most effective medication for ADHD is the various extended release stimulants. Um, there are some other options available, including some short acting stimulants. Generally speaking, the extended release stimulants just work a whole lot better, like they just do for most people. And I sometimes say, if you can't tell whether or not it's working, then it's not working. So if you're kind of like, I don't know, I mean, I guess it helps a bit. That's not good enough, right? Like probably with a different dose or maybe a different medication, you could probably get to something that really, really is clear. Yeah, I can definitely tell the difference that it's working. Um, and not simply that it's working during the day, but if we're talking about couples, the other thing I wanna know is, is it still working at night, right? Like are your coworkers getting all the benefit, but your partner at home, because by the time you see them in the evening, the medication is worn off. If so, maybe a little bit of the short acting might be helpful to extend out the benefit for all the things that you need to do at home, you know, on the nights that the butler has, you know, has the night off. Um, so is it working at night? I also want to know if you take medication during the week, do you also take it on the weekends? Because probably you should, right? Like, I don't know, maybe if you got a lazy Sunday, enjoy it. But probably most of us don't have a ton of lazy Sundays. So at least one of those two days out of the weekend, probably taking your medication that day also would be helpful just to, again, handle those boring responsibilities of adult life, get a bit more balanced in the workload, have your partner a little bit more appreciative of it. So that's strategy number one is consider medication. Our second strategy is, and again, this is true for all couples, but especially true for some couples, is to get really clear on the difference between preferences and limits. And let's kind of define what they each are. So a preference is, you know, things that we prefer. Um, and what we prefer is based on what our personal experience is, what our temperament is, what our values are, just whatever, right? Some things seem more, pref you know, enjoyable than other things. Um, the thing about preferences is they're not factual, right? There's lots of ways to do things, all of which are totally fine, but some of them we prefer more than others. It's kind of like saying, I like milk in my coffee. Oh, I like mine black. You can make as many arguments as you want it. You can either, you can even ascribe, you know, moral judgment to it. But at the end of the day, like you like what you like and you don't like what you don't. So how neat does a bedroom need to be? There's not actually a right answer to that. We have ideas, we have preferences, but there's no right or wrong about it. So if you're going to live with any other people, having some, you know, clarity on I prefer it this way instead of that way is really sort of helpful. But we don't necessarily get everything that we want. And this is then where limits come in. So limits are a subset of preferences. Limits are the things that we feel like, you know what, I can't flex on this. This to me is too important. If I give it up, I'm either going to resent you or I'm going to resent me. So I'm not going to give it up, right? This is a thing that's really important. The thing of it is you can't have a thousand limits. Some things can be limits, but other things can't. So as an example, had a couple, I was talking to a couple nights ago or last week, and you know, the thing came up about getting their young son ready for school in the morning. So stuff like he has to have his gloves on because you know it's cold where they live. Okay, that might be a limit, right? That's kind of a safety thing. That's kind of important. Sure, okay, you know, he's got to have his gloves. Things like he has to have his hair combed. I don't know. That's not a safety thing. Now, it might be that, you know, this non ADHD partner might say, look, to me, this is really, really important. Fine. Or they may say, you know what? 
I would like him to have his hair combed, but really more important is I want to make sure he's dressed for the weather, right? Like that might be a place to be a little bit flexible. Or for the partner with ADHD there to say, these are the things that to me are the most important. Here are the other things that I would like, but I'm willing to let them go, right? So really being clear about the battles to fight and the battles to let go. Big strategy number three. Make time to talk business. Um, if you're a couple, if you're an, you know, an adult couple with adult responsibilities, especially if you have like jobs and kids and mortgages and you know, grocery shopping and all the other stuff of life, it's important to make time at least weekly, preferably it might have to be a little bit more, but to just kind of run through what's happening. Um, and often I find that the couples I meet with aren't making the time to do it because it doesn't go well. So it's understandable that they want to avoid it because it's, it's kind of an awful experience for both people. But the problem is when you avoid it, it sets up the next time to be awful. Or when you don't resolve things this time, it sets it up for them not to be resolved next time. So getting into the habit to meet, let's say, Sunday mornings or Tuesday nights or whatever, to run through what's going on. Um, bring your to-do list, bring your calendar. So it's not just talky-talky, but it's actually like things getting written down, things get getting entered so that we really like are more likely to follow through on them later. Um, I think having a shared online calendar can be really helpful, especially for busy couples, like too much happens on the fly. You can just sort of put it in and you don't have to remember to tell your partner or get into a fight about whether, you know, the partner was told or not told. Um, if something is important to you, I would really appreciate if you could, you know, bring the kids to the dentist on Thursday, let's say, right? If it's really important, make the request firmly but cleanly. And, and a clean request is only the request. Hey, I would really appreciate if on Thursday you could be the one to take the kids. Less of a clean request is, I need you to take the kids on to the dentist on Thursday because I've got so much else. I'm always the one who has to do everything. The last five times I've been the one to take them to the dentist. And when I ask you to do things, you don't, you say you do it. And then the last minute you bail on me, right? That is not a clean request. There's too many other topics getting brought up. It muddies the waters and you're less likely to get what you're asking for. So straightforward, direct, clean requests. If your partner makes a clean request, then take it cleanly. Okay, yeah, I can do that. I will find a way to make it happen on Thursday to take the kids. Or actually, I can't. I don't have time. I will not now here on Sunday as we sit and talk, I will not have time on Thursday. Better to disappoint early than late. But the only way to know if you can actually do it is to actually look at your calendar, to actually look at your to-do list and to really sort of figure it out. Um, so in terms of this then, show respect for your partner by doing the task if it's asked of you. Um, if your partner does the task, then show some appreciation, especially if it's a thing that you know your partner is really just doing as a generous deed, right? They don't really care that much, but they know you care, so fine. If they're going to make the effort to do it, make a bit of effort to show appreciation because you're more likely to get them to do it next time if you showed some appreciation this time. Big strategy number four. Make time to have fun, right? Relationships are not just about business. They're not just about running a household. They're about actually enjoying each other. And it's it's just one of those kind of sad things that when we're busy, and especially when you put young kids in the mix, but even so, right? When we're busy, we stop enjoying each other. We kind of stop having fun together, um, which is not just sad because like, you know, your days are less enjoyable, but it, but it also it strains the relationship because there's less goodwill there to kind of weather the inevitable bumps and bruises and snafus that come up in daily life, right? So something gets messed up, somebody forgets to do something, somebody overreacts, whatever. You know, if you had some fun yesterday, if you're enjoying each other, if there's a bit of that positive regard, it's a lot easier to like weather the storm, right? And get through to the other side and still feel okay with each other. Um, 
so I think getting out and, you know, it's that old cliche of doing date nights or whatever it is, something somehow where you go out and you have fun and there's no shop talk. There's no talking about like, oh, we got to call the roofer and, you know, what are we doing about summer camps and right? No business, just having fun together. But it's a lot easier to have the fun together sometimes if at other times you're handling the business side, right? So you got to sort of honor both sides of that. But even if it's just a kind of quick check-in, you know, watching a show together on Tuesday night, and I have couples who've been together a while who say like, well, well, we don't really have any shared interests or there's nothing we enjoy doing together. It's kind of like a weird and sad thing, but it's true that like sometimes it actually takes a bit of work in order to find something fun, right? Like maybe you've, the stuff that used to be fun, somebody's grown out of, fine. What else can you do? What are the things that you can find that, that you can enjoy together? And maybe one of you enjoys it more than the other. Okay, you can still enjoy your partner's enjoyment, but what are the things that you can do? And, and to really put a little bit of genuine energy into it, the idea that fun just happens, it's a nice idea and sometimes it works out, but sometimes we gotta actually put a bit of effort to make it fun and that's okay. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It just means that's what life looks like as an adult sometimes. Finally, as our fifth kind of big strategy is that good sex is important, right? Good sex is good for your relationship. Um, in that when you look at the, the data on happy couples or unhappy couples, uh, overall relationship satisfaction and more specifically sexual satisfaction are pretty highly correlated, more so for some than for others, but but even so, the more happy you are in one, probably the more happy you will be in the other. The more unhappy you are in one, likely it will spill over into the other as well. And the reason why they overlap is to have good sex with your partner where you're both happy to be there and you're both enjoying it, you're both enjoying each other, requires good behavior beforehand, right? You can't act like a jerk during the day and expect to have great sex at night. That doesn't work. Um, but also having good sex today, feeling connected, having fun with your partner in this way, being generous, receiving generosity, it also tends to bring out good behavior. So good sex today hopefully leads to some better behavior tomorrow, right? We're both on the same team, we're both working together, we're both really happy to be here. So if you want your relationship to be better, probably investing a bit of energy in your sex life is a good idea. If you want your sex life to be better, probably investing a bit of energy in working in your relationship more broadly is a good idea. Um, all of this gets connected together. So. A question maybe is to ask yourself, like, what gets in the way of a more satisfying sex life? If I want our sex life to be better, how do we get there? What's important to me? What's important to my partner? Um, or maybe the sex is good when it happens, but it doesn't happen as much as you would like it to. Okay, how do we how do we make it happen more often? How do we prioritize? some time for ourselves to enjoy each other and not just make it about everything else. And it's easy to make it about everything else. So, you know, good couples are able to find time both to work well together on the demands of life and also to enjoy each other in this and other ways. So let's jump into questions, but my website is adultadhdbook.com. I've got a bunch of information there. Obviously, Chad has a ton of information. I know that medication is helpful. However, I don't have health insurance and can't afford it. Are there any other things that I can do to be more att attentive and less impulsive with my partner without medication? Yeah. And, and that is a reality that there are people who for various reasons can't afford it or possibly aren't able to take it for you know medical or other reasons. So, um, I mean, so there are like, so first of all, some of the non or the short acting versions and non extended release versions might be 
inexpensive enough that they are more affordable than the extended release ones, even in the generic. So that might be something to consider. But, you know, otherwise, the advice I would give is exercise certainly can be helpful for all of us. We should all be working out regularly for lots of reasons. But especially for folks with ADHD, it can kind of quiet some of that distractibility, can calm some of that sort of um, restless impulsivity. So certainly that is a good thing. Certainly I would encourage you to get more sleep. This is another obvious thing that's good for everybody, but easier said than done. But I think otherwise, you know, when you're spending time with your partner, whether it's we're having fun here, or especially if we need to have a conversation about something, and maybe it's just something boring like logistics for the week, Maybe it's something stressful that like, okay, this is going to be a hard conversation <sighs> to really sort of take a couple deep breaths to really sort of like settle into the situation, turn off the TV, put away the phone and to say like, this is important. I would like us to have a conversation. Can we just sort of take a couple deep breaths and really sort of slow ourselves down and really in an intentional way, kind of make that effort to do so. Um, I would also suggest, frankly, to either partner, right, if your partner has a strong initial reaction to something, don't just take the bait and run with it immediately. Maybe that's the place for you to say, kind of stop, pause, give them a second to catch themselves rather than being kind of off to the races on the thing that they just said. Or, I don't know, I've kind of had this line rolling around in my head, like, don't believe everything your partner says, right? So in other words, don't take their first reaction as gospel and instead kind of slow it down and really find out, okay, like, wait a second, what are you really saying here? Is that actually what you think? Is that not really what you think? Because sometimes we sort of react in the moment and it's not really, really what we think. So, um, so really make an effort to slow those conversations down, ask a lot of questions and, you know, have a good negotiation about what are we doing here. I really like the uh, weekly meeting idea. However, my husband is restless and impatient when I talk. How can we overcome that obstacle? First idea is maybe some of these conversations happen not just sort of sitting. Maybe, I don't know, you go for a walk around the neighborhood. And if you're moving, um, maybe that makes it easier for him to kind of tolerate really kind of like being present and staying connected. So that's one idea. Alternatively, you know, if he works out first and then you have the conversation, that might be a better time. Or are there better times of day to have that conversation and if so really you know carve out and hold sacred the time so you don't have the conversations at times that are not good ones um i think also is you know to sort of meet in the middle here so for your part the non-adhd partner really get clear on okay what are my priorities really what do i want to talk about what's most important what do we really need to cover and don't try to cover 50 things, right? Really sort of focus in, start with the most important and then work your way down from there so you don't sort of overtax what he's able to give. But I think for his part, to really make that effort to like stay, stay present, right? Stay attuned, stay connected. If he needs a break, call a timeout, go get a drink of water, whatever, walk around come on back, right? So don't sort of force a conversation where he's no longer in it. Um, and yet it's also reasonable to ask him to do his best to kind of stay attuned. So, you know, so really kind of talk about how do we, what is the, how do we set this up for the best odds of success? How do we do these conversations so it's most likely to work out well? And, you know, to figure out what that is and then really try to make that happen. I understand the importance of um, planning a date night, but I often do it impulsively and say, let's go out rather than um, making plans ahead of time and it, and it irritates my partner. Are there things that I can do to plan better, you know, for those date nights rather than just, you know, doing it on a whim? So I think this is where having a bit more clarity on what the schedule is can be really helpful. So, you know, if in the moment you're like, oh, I want to go out, let's do something. To be able to look at the schedule and, and know whether it's a reasonable thing to put it out there. Um, but I don't know. I guess I would sort of encourage you if you feel like doing it, 
put it out there, right? Like don't hold yourself back. On the other hand, I would also encourage your partner to be honest about whether they're up for it, right? So if if they're willing to be convinced of like, uh, I was thinking, you know, we're going to do this. So I don't know, like be willing to be convinced, but also be willing to kind of hold the boundary. If you're like, you know what? I love the idea of going out. It's just going to stress me out more. So like, I, sorry, no go. I don't want to do it. Um, and to feel like to not sort of take it personally, if there's an offer to go out when it's not good timing, um, and then for the partner who has ADHD to recognize that, that every impulsive offer isn't going to get a yes, but that's okay. Um, so, you know, some of this, I think, is, is that laying the groundwork so that overall things are managed a little bit better makes a little bit more room to just sort of wing it in the moment. Do you think that a person with ADHD uses sex as both a, a way of connecting intimately and also, is it self-medication uh, for their ADHD? We have sex for many different reasons, depending on the moment, depending on the circumstance. Um, and it can even sort of the what we're doing there can change even over the course of one sexual encounter. So there's a lot of reasons um, why we might want to be sexual. You know, in some of the research I did, I, I found that people with ADHD of both genders, assuming there's only two, which there's not, but whatever, um, you know, people people with ADHD tend to be more, a bit more interested in sex than people without, at least based on the research that I did. So, um, so I think there's a lot of reasons for why that is. Some of it is self-medicating. Some of it's kind of self-stimulating because let's be honest, sex is probably more interesting than most of the other responsible things that we need to do in life. Um, it is a way to connect with our partner. It's a way to connect with ourselves. It's a way to sort of calm ourselves down. It's a way to, to kind of excite ourselves up. Like there's a lot of things that can happen in a sexual encounter. So I don't know that any of it's necessarily bad or necessarily good. It's it's really kind of what do you do with it? So having some conversation about what for each of you, you would like out of your sexual encounters. What about it feels good or interesting or exciting? What about it maybe feels not as good? And to really try to take it into account because it's hard to convince someone to do something that doesn't make them feel good, right? If they don't feel connected, if they don't feel uh, respected or like they're enjoying it or their needs aren't being met, you're going to have a harder time getting this person to kind of jump into bed with you the next time. So, you know, have those conversations about what is going to make it an enjoyable encounter for both people. And sometimes, and especially in couples who have kind of different levels of sexual interest, sometimes the sexual encounters are not equal in the sense that one person gets more out of it than the other person. That's okay. It's sort of, I don't know, like there's this fancy garden center near here. My wife loves it. I'm okay with it, right? It's fine. I'm willing to go there now and then. Okay. But that's fine. Like it doesn't have to be the same experience for both of us. We can both still enjoy it in a little bit of generosity. And one part of your week hopefully pays off in other parts of your week as well. All right. Um, the next question or statement um, is, uh, that this person also has depression and anxiety, and some of the medications um, that this person is taking reduces their libido, so their life, sex life is compromised. Do you have any suggestions, yeah. ways to help? And that is definitely, so the, the SSRI, the serotonin antidepressants are kind of notorious for their potential sexual side effects. So SSRIs meaning Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, those are the main ones, um, and then whatever the generic names are. But, um, you know, so for some people, it just sort of reduces their general interest in sex overall. Um, for some people, it makes it harder to become aroused or to reach orgasm. So, you know, it could be to greater degrees or lesser degrees. This is definitely a known side effect. Um, on the one hand, you might want to talk to your doctor about it. Maybe one medication is worse on the side effects than the others. It takes a bit of finagling sometimes to get the one that works the best. But, you know, sometimes it might also be one of those things where your general interest in sex is less, but if things start up, if you're like, well, I'm not that into it right now, but I'm willing to see where this goes, 
you may find that that your desire does actually kind of show up and that things actually do kind of work out well. Um, and that, you know, sometimes you just got to be willing to kind of see where it goes and to put a bit more effort in. And I think it's a good opportunity, which is maybe a, a generous way of putting it. It's a good opportunity to work on being really clear with your partner about what it is that would work for you, right? Here, because generally I have less desire, here are the things that will really do the most for me. Here are the things you could do outside of bed. Here are things you can do in bed that are going to be most enjoyable for me, which are going to probably get you more sex if, if that is a thing that you're looking for. So it just, it means a bit more communication, a bit more honesty, a bit more asking for what you want, and a bit more ability to kind of be okay with your partner being direct about asking for what they want. This person um, thinks that their partner has ADHD who has not, and they have not been diagnosed, and they're, they're having challenges with um, emotional control when dealing with the children. Um, are there any suggestions that you have? I know it's a rather large topic, sure. <laughs> this, this one, but do you have any suggestions for this person? So, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is not an uncommon situation. Unfortunately, there's a lot of adults out there um, who have ADHD who have not been diagnosed with it. Probably there's a lot more undiagnosed adults than there are diagnosed adults. So, um, so I, you know, I think it, it's a question of how open is your partner to consider the possibility that maybe you know ADHD is a part of what's going on for them. Um, if they are, or at least they're willing to be convinced, then my advice is bring it up directly and say, like, you know, here's my here's my guess. Maybe I'm not a clinician, but you know, based on what I know, here's what seems likely. Here are the ways that it shows up in your life. Here's how it makes life harder for me. Here's how it makes life harder for you, or it also affects the kids, right? So to be just very kind of direct and honest about it with, with good intentions, right? I'm bringing this up because I think all of our lives will be a little bit better if we can address this directly. Um, if your partner is less open to it, um, either because they're kind of defensive about it or they don't believe in ADHD or they just don't get it. Like, I, I don't know, I'm not, that's, I'm not a kind of hyperactive kid. That's not me. Um, they don't sort of understand how it's affecting them right now. I think in that case, then what you do is you talk about the end result. You know, it, it seems to me that you often lose your temper with the kids, for example, right? That's an observation I'm making. Um, and maybe hopefully if that's true then that is a thing that your partner does have you know some feelings about and recognize like yeah i know i would like to be more patient they do kind of make me crazy sometimes so if you can agree on the sort of end result of it then maybe you can work backwards to you know here's my guess of what's going on or you know we've tried other things for you to lose your temper less with the kids, it's not working. Like we still keep having the same struggles. Maybe there's something else that we need to look at. Maybe we need to look somewhere else for solutions. Because if the same old solutions don't yield different results, clearly something isn't working here, right? Clearly we're missing something. And it may be that, you know, it's really the end result that you care about is your partner being more patient with the kids. ADHD, whatever, like who cares? It doesn't matter. You know, like you're not invested in the explanation, you're invested in the outcome. But to get the outcome, we might need to figure out what the explanation is. So maybe that's the sales pitch to them. Um, the next statement question is, um, my partner seems to take any feedback that I give negatively and it triggers him into a depression and a lot of times when i speak to this person um my intentions are not to put him down or anything like that but um he takes it negatively is there anything in the approach that will make things the conversation a little bit more productive i guess so i think this is a two-person story right as everything in relationships is so i'll start with talking about what the non-adhd partner can do in terms of how they approach and then what you know, some things maybe the partner with ADHD can do in terms of how they receive it. So for the non-ADHD partner, the advice I would give is to really be careful about how you present things. Now, that doesn't mean that you sugarcoat and doesn't mean that you sort of, you know, 
only say half of what you're thinking, but to really, really sort of work on the delivery. And that sometimes what happens is, especially with a partner who doesn't feel very approachable, is it sort of builds and builds and builds. And then when it comes out, there is an edge. Like indeed your partner's picking up on the fact that you are really angry or resentful or frustrated or or whatever it is that you feel. So really kind of work on a clean delivery. But I would also kind of, you know, if you're doing that and still it feels like your partner isn't able to take it well, to really sort of have that conversation and to say like, you know, I feel like there are times when I try to bring stuff up in an honest way and and you hear it as more negative than I mean it. And I'm not, I don't really understand why that is. So help me understand like what's going on when I bring something up in an effort to try to be helpful that it comes across as a criticism. And then you do a whole lot of questions and a whole bunch of listening and to really kind of hear what your partner is saying in that moment. Um, And probably this is going to be one of several conversations on the topic. Um, But it might also be that it comes to a point where you sort of say, you know what, I never had the intention to make you feel bad. But also, I have to be able to bring things up. Like, I need for you to be able to tolerate me bringing up concerns and even complaints. I know you don't love it. None of us do. But, like, as partners, as people who live together and, you know, love together, like, I need you to be able to tolerate me bringing up things that sometimes make you uncomfortable without, you know, kind of falling into depression over it. and. If that's not a thing that you're able to do, then maybe either we or you need to go see a therapist and kind of work on that because this might be about stuff that's bigger than whatever is happening in the moment. But for us to really be happy together, we have to be able to bring these things up. We have to be able to have productive conversations about it. This is where a good relationship pushes you to become a better person, right? It's not always fun, by which I mean, usually it isn't fun, but it is really important. And, you know, this may be the place that your partner hopefully is able to kind of step up and do something different and you as well in terms of how you do the approach. Um, The next uh, topic is um, the feeling of a partner without ADHD um, feeling like a parent to a partner with ADHD, the example provided is the partner with ADHD asks for the partner without ADHD to make lists to help them remember things, and they feel a little bit resentful um, in having to do that. Do you have any suggestions on helping with that dynamic? Yeah. And that, so this is a common thing. Um, You know, you could call the parent-child dynamic, you could call the under-function or over-function or dynamic, you know, whatever. But but this is definitely a common thing when ADHD is not well-managed. It's easy to slide into this dynamic of of no longer being equals. You're not peers anymore, but the non-ADHD partner rises up and becomes a little more responsible than ADHD partner sort of slides down and becomes a bit less responsible. It makes sense. Like it's easy to see how a couple could end up there, but it's not a fun place to be for most couples. Um, So on the one hand, I'm all in favor of division of labor. So if the non-ADHD partner is better at writing lists or they feel less anxious, they feel a bit like more confident that things will happen if they're the one who writes the list, fine. Okay, maybe that's not a big deal. Um, But if they have to chase the partner with ADHD, if they have to hound them, if the partner is like they have to report in on what they've done, like you know, a child reporting to a parent or an employee reporting to the boss, that's probably not gonna be a good thing for the relationship overall. So on the one hand, better managing ADHD in general probably will have some positive effect on that parent-child dynamic. Um, so, you know, taking medication or making sure the medication is actually working might be a part of that. Um, but I think also for the non-ADHD partner, if it feels like it shifts the dynamic in the relationship for you to be the one who manages the list, I'd say have a conversation with your partner and say, like, look, 
I, I don't want to be the one who does the list. Like I need you to be able to do your own list. Um, and, you know, maybe possibly one of the reasons to give, one of the motivations is um, parent-child dynamics are a total, besides being a general relationship killer, they're specifically, they're kind of a sex killer. Um, it really, it's hard to feel sexual with someone in that parent-child dynamic, whether you're the parent or the child, right? So if this is a thing that your partner is interested in more of, um, you might make a connection between the parent-child dynamic and perhaps you're being less sexually interested. So um, he has something to gain by stepping up on the list um, because it'll benefit the relationship in other bigger ways. The good news is, is that for this couple, uh, the partner was recently diagnosed with ADHD. However, the partner without ADHD is still holding on to a lot of, um, of that past history mm -hmm. and those feelings. Um, do you have any suggestions for this couple? Yeah, this is a very common thing. And they, you know, for me personally, one of the things that's really kind of gratifying in working with folks with ADHD is the big difference that we can make in people's lives by really understanding the impact that ADHD is having and you know doing a few of the right things differently. So it doesn't change the past, it doesn't make the past go away, but it really offers the hope for a better future. And there's, there's a saying, there's an old saying, it's, doesn't completely apply here, but it sort of does, which is, you know, sometimes the best revenge is living well, right? So to recognize the past wasn't what we wanted it to be. I really wish things were different then, but more important, what are we doing now? Like today, tomorrow, next week, next month, what are we doing to make the the future better than the past was. And, you know, to sort of recognize with a bit of compassion and forgiveness that despite some good effort, despite some good intentions on both of your parts, you're really sort of at a handicap in terms of being able to create a better relationship in the past. But with that knowledge and now some good effort and good intentions, we can make things better going forward. I think that is your best hope, right? To sort of, to be able to leave the past in the past and to recognize, um, you know, that there were some good intentions that just, you know, were getting kind of tripped up and, and not coming to fruition the way that you would want them to. But I think to really kind of be engaged in the treatment process for both partners, really be engaged in understanding ADHD and how it shows up in their life and in their relationship, um, and to have some good conversations about like, what are we working on? What are our priorities? Therefore, what's a bit less of a priority, but what are we working on to make this next chapter in our life much better than the prior chapters? And to come back to that kind of thing where we started, ADHD doesn't invent new problems. It just exacerbates the universal ones. Every couple who's been together for a while, like we all have things in our past where like, God, I would have done that. I would totally do that differently now knowing what I know. So ADHD is not unique in that way, but it certainly can feel kind of like a, a pretty stark example when it happens. So so I think there, there's hope for you guys. The future legitimately can look a lot different than the past. I'm glad that you're here kind of checking this out. Do you have any advice with for couples who both have ADHD? We both find communication very challenging. We both forget a lot in our communication. Um, anything that feels like a criticism turns the conversation in a very negative way. So I think especially when both partners have ADHD, it just means you need to be kind of like that much more diligent about making sure that conversations happen under the right circumstances. So not when the kids are running around, not in bed at night when somebody's falling asleep, not in the morning when someone's rushing out the door, like really kind of carve out and make sacred that time, even if it's just two minutes to have a good conversation without distractions, really make a point that, that things that get talked about also get captured, right? So like, oh, here's that thing. Yeah, okay, here, I'm putting it onto my to-do list or I'm sending you an email about it or I put it onto the calendar or I scribbled it on and I slapped it on the fridge on a post-it note, right? So it's not just good intentions in the air, but actually actions that follow. Um, 
I think in terms of the feeling hurt and the getting defensive, you know, really, really work on delivery for both partners, really work on slowing things down. Um, but if you're on the receiving end of what feels like a really negative comment, rather than just sort of like, again, being off to the races with it, to really make that effort to pause, which by the way is easier when your medication is working, to really sort of pause and check in with your partner whether that's really what they intended. Like that that felt really critical. Did you Did you mean that as critical or not? And that gives your partner a chance either to say, uh, no, totally, that was not critical, or to say, um, okay, yeah, actually, I, I probably did have a lot more of a tone there than I should have. So, like, I'm sorry, let me, let me say, give me a second shot here. Let me say that again. And that way you can fix it and not, you know, get sort of off in the ditch on it just because one of you guys had a bit of a snarky tone or something. So again, universal stuff, just a bit more so when one person or both people in the couple have ADHD. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to say, Dr. Tuckman? I, I appreciate you guys coming out. I'm glad that you're investing in yourself. I'm glad that you're investing in your relationship. Chad has a ton of resources. Um, you know, we do the conference every year in November. We'll be in Dallas this coming November 2022. Um, but also, you can get recordings of past conferences where there's, you know, I presented on relationships, Melissa Orlov and others have presented on relationships. Um, there's a bunch of stuff already up on the Chad site, you know, free and accessible um, about relationships and ADHD. So do not go it alone. Do not reinvent the wheel. Learn from the good people who've come before you. Thank you. That was great. Very helpful. Um, thank you for providing us with all of the information, the tips, and answering everybody's questions. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate you being here.